Hey, good morning, church. Hey, uh, if I haven't had the chance to meet you, my name is Aaron Lax, and I'm an associate pastor here at Vibrant. And if that is a new title for you, because uh, my former title was worship pastor, I'm an associate pastor uh, because I received a promotion. Um, so yeah, that's fine. You know, listen, that's... It's a big deal. It's not a big deal. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, but, but I'm going to oversee not just our, our weekend uh, experience with the Lord, um, but also adult discipleship, which we're calling formation. Um, so I'm excited about that. And, and all that means is um, I'm, I'm really passionate about helping all of us fall in love with Jesus more. And part of that discipleship process is equipping you to be able to lead others in the same way. And so I'm excited about it. I believe that each and every single one of you is called into the spaces and places on earth to minister right where you are. So you may not have a staff ministry title, but you are doing ministry in the spaces and places where God has placed you. So I'm excited to help equip us in that way. Let's get into the message today. Uh, we're wrapping up the series, How to Change the World. And, and really this series is, is I, I hope it's encouraged you. And, I, and really, I hope it's challenged you and, and pushed you in maybe a way that you haven't been challenged before to get you on mission uh, for Jesus, to share what God has done in your life with others. And I'm, I'm uh, honored to, to wrap this up today uh, and, and really... Uh, capture how God relates to, to us. And, and there's, there's some nuances to our relationship with God because there, there's this paradox. There's this two opposing ideas that we talk about sometimes when talking about the human condition. We're both beautifully and wonderfully made, and everyone has value in the eyes of God. We're also broken. We're sinful we have a default position. It is our nature to choose things that are not God, and we can't fix it ourselves. We need his help. So the two kind of collide, and then God relates to that somehow. That's what we're going to talk about today as we wrap up this series. And that's the, that's the big idea here at the top. Um, the thing I want you to just have in your mind as we, as we dive in today is our broken condition, that is our sin nature, our broken condition is not a disqualifier for his love. Uh, I, in 2005, I, I graduated high school and started uh, my college experience. And uh, I, I went to college for a couple reasons, but mainly I, I wanted to be a leader in the military. I was compelled uh, in, in my teenage years by what I saw on 9-11. I grew up in a military uh, home, and so soldiers were, had always been my hero, and I wanted to be like them, and, and I saw this need, and so I was like, all right, I'm going to go do this. Um, and so I went off to college to go uh, be a part of a program that helps me get ready, helped me get ready to lead uh, our, our military. And, and so uh, freshman year hits, everything's going great. I got a full ride scholarship, contracted as a cadet, and everything was going great until uh, the end of October. So I contracted at the beginning of October, got the news I was on a full ride scholarship. Parents of graduates said, hello, that's awesome. <laughs> no school debt. Uh, and at the end of the, uh, the month, uh, or maybe it was the beginning of November, it's kind of fuzzy now, but uh, my knee just exploded one day. Um, it was stupid. I was like walking and I felt it give out. And it was probably the summation of a couple injuries that I had incurred uh, prior to that and some of the training that we were going through. And uh, without getting too graphic, so if you're squeamish, cover your ears, I, I, uh, I popped my ACL clean through my meniscus. And then I basically had no control over my knee when I stepped. Uh, and I fell on my kneecap and my kneecap shattered into like a hundred tiny bits. And so I get rushed to the ER. I, I you know, of course I'm going to need surgery and I, it's a military hospital and I'm, I'm meeting with the surgeon and I meet my surgeon and his name is Dr. Slaughter. Uh, <laughs> what a great name, right? <laughs> Sounds like a Marvel universe villain, right? Um, <laughs> But I meet with Dr. Slaughter and he's looking at the, the knee and he's like, he's talking to my parents who were there at the time and we're gonna have to put a plastic kneecap. We can't repair this. So I have a really cool plastic knee now uh, at 19 years old. And so I come back and I, I get back to school and I recovered from surgery and I meet with our professors of military science. They sit me down and I, of course I have a, like a little cast thing on and uh, my knee's the size of a watermelon and they're looking at me and they're like, man, this is, this is not great. This is not a great way to, to start your military career. It's not looking good. 
uh, we really need you to consider other options. And I said, well, what, do you, what do you mean? And they were like, well, you, you got six months to basically run two miles in 15 minutes. And I was 19 and didn't know any better. I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I could do that. That's fine. Uh, at 37 now, I'd be like, nope, just give me the medical benefits. I'll just go back to sitting on the couch. It's fine. I'll find another job. But at 19, I was determined. And I was really discouraged even after that meeting, I was like, I, I got, it's fixed. Just give me time. Just give me time to, to overcome this. And in that moment, I felt like I was just disqualified before I even had a chance to start, that they wouldn't even let me have the chance to just try to overcome the brokenness that I had experienced. So my question for you today, have you ever felt disqualified? Has something happened to you in your life and somebody said, That's just too big for you to overcome. You'll never amount to anything. Or have you said that to someone? Have you done that? Have you disqualified someone in your life because of things that they've done or things that have happened to them? So this this big idea I really want to get after today is it's, I'm going to use some church lingo here. So if this is your new time to church, I'll, I'll break it down for you. But unmerited grace And you'll hear us use the word grace a lot, but that's really just God's love, God's gift towards us, his love for us and his desire to be in a relationship with us. Unmerited meaning you can't earn it. You can't earn God's love. Unmerited grace. Your qualities, good and bad, do not qualify you for his love. In fact, we're we're qualified by Jesus And so that's our title of our message today as we dive into uh, our final message series. And we're really going to close the the loop on Luke chapter 15 and one of the last parables in that chapter called the prodigal son. You've probably heard that parable before. Drew mentioned two parables last week in that chapter. And so uh, this is kind of a continuation of the same general idea uh, of how God relates to, to humans, to broken people. Um, both beautifully made and broken. Um, And just to set up the context again, Jesus is intentionally using these parables, not just to talk to the Jewish, Jewish people of today, but as we'll read, it actually has cultural implications for us as well. Let's start in Luke chapter 15, verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And I'm going to pause here real quick because we're, we're already dealing with a couple like cultural weird things here. Uh, so for us here in the West, here in America in 2024, uh, a younger son going to his father before the father has passed is out of the norm, right? Like usually the way we do it is the parents pass on to the next life. We have wills and estates and all this stuff. And we pass that on to our family to inherit. This is actually kind of a normal thing to happen in Jewish uh, traditions of that day where uh, the family could go to the parents before they had passed to ask for their inheritance. The challenge here, uh, which Jesus is using this specifically, is that the, the implication of the son here is that he is young, that he is younger. And so there's a little bit of a risk here. There's a little bit of scandal and controversy right out of the gate because the younger son is going to take his estate, his inheritance, and, and, and leave the family, essentially. And that is a dishonorable thing in uh, Jewish culture of that day. Uh, to abandon responsibility to the family was dishonorable. Let's keep reading. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So the boys went to Vegas, baby. Hey, put it all on red, went to the Spear. I'd love to go see the Spear one day. That is a cool like music venue. But he went to Vegas and spent all that he had. And, and I think, again, there's a couple cultural things I'm gonna draw out here just so we can pay attention to. Uh, we read this, and I'd, I'd argue probably most of you read this. And if I was to ask you, uh, how did the son end up in a bad position? We, we'd say he squandered his wealth. He made a mistake and he got what he deserved. And that's what most people in the West would say. That's just our cultural value. We see uh, 
at work ethic as being uh, important to us. Uh, we don't like being lazy. We don't elevate it in our culture. And, and so that's how we would approach it. But there's uh, a, a church organization that actually polls different cultures throughout the world, different uh, churches in cultures, and they ask them this question, how did the son end up in a bad spot? And so again, here in the West, we'd say it was his work ethic. It was his lack of uh, discipline or maturity or his wisdom. Uh, if you go to Asia, the churches in Asia would say, well, it was a lack of generosity. People weren't generous enough to him to help him when he had made uh, mistakes. And then if you go to Africa, they'd say, well, really it was the conditions around him. The famine that he experienced got him into this bad place. And so uh, I'm just trying to draw it here how we perceive sometimes uh, the world around us. And here in our culture, sometimes we perceive it through the lens of performance. We see it through the lens of performance. But this, in this moment, um, life is tough for the son um, and for us. And sometimes we make it tougher on ourselves when we go looking for love in all the wrong places. And that's where the son kind of finds himself in this moment. As we keep reading, but when he came to himself, and I, I love that line, uh, when he came to himself, it's like a, an awakening of the soul. And and it's a moment of clarity for him. Like he had been kind of drifting along, had this plan in his mind, and um, maybe was just kind of stooping along in life. And then life hits him and he has this awareness moment. Has that ever happened to you? He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will rise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. He realized in this moment, his only hope was the father, that his dad was the only means of getting him out of this mess. And uh, if you he heard it, he, he unqualifies himself. He says, I am, I've, I've done too much wrong to be worthy to be called uh, a son of the father. I, I'm better off just being a servant to the father, at least I'll be taken care of. A Jewish tradition of the day, this is another one of those cultural nuances in this story. Uh, there's this idea of, it's called kazaza, a fun word to say, kazaza. And what that means is uh, when a family member or a member of the community either dishonored himself or dishonored the family, they had the legal right to banish this person and even condemn them to death. And I bring that up because of the next moment that we see in the next verse is the son returns home. We read, but while he was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. It's a significant moment considering the tradition, right? Right? The, the legal right of banishing the son, the, the, the obligation maybe even of the community to condemn him to death. And yet, what does the father do? The father sees him from a long way off, scanning the horizon, doesn't wait for the son to get closer, doesn't even allow him to get his apology in first, doesn't tell the son, hey, go, go get cleaned up, you, you stink, you smell like alcohol, go get a shower, come back, we're gonna have a family meeting, uh, you've got a lot of debts you've got to repay, so we're going to come up with a plan for that, and then you know we'll have this teaching moment together, and then maybe down the road we'll consider repairing the relationship. No, what does the father do? He sees the son from a long way off and runs to him and goes after him. The father, God, our father, draws close to us even when we are fall, far from him. And the father took the first step. So the following verses, we're not going to read it, but um, there's a party. The father welcomes him back, embraces him, kisses him, uh, and throws a party. We talked about this idea of heaven celebrating when the lost come home and uh, the parable last week about the, the betrothed uh, woman looking for the lost coin. And then she finally finds the coin and throws a party and invites the community. Well, we see the same pattern happening here. The lost coming home, a party, a big party happens. The whole community, this community that had the legal right to condemn the son to death is invited in. And, and what Jesus is trying to say in this moment is that th th there is a 
massive celebration when anyone that is far from Jesus comes to him. It's not the steady like, all right, well, we got to go through this book. We'll read this book together and then we'll do this discipleship program. And then maybe, maybe we'll consider, you know, having a party later down the road. No, he, he welcomes them in, throws them a party right away. He doesn't wait for all the stuff to kind of get sorted out. But not everyone is happy. This parable is called the prodigal son. And in my opinion, Maybe it should be called the story of the two lost sons. There's two people in this story, and they're both lost. You have the younger one, the prodigal, who runs away, squanders all that he had, comes home. And then you have the older brother. And the older brother is actually where I want to focus our time today. The older brother becomes angry, became angry, and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. And he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. Do you hear the entitlement in this? Dad, it's not fair. Look at what I've done. Look at, I've been faithful to you for years and you don't give me a fattened calf? You don't give me the convertible car to go out with my buddies on the weekend? Come on, dad. This son of yours doesn't even call him a brother. The father responds, my son, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and now is found. So the brother was missing it. The brother was contrasting his behavior against his brothers. I am qualified to receive all that you have because of what I've done. I am qualified to be loved by you, to get your stuff. See, he didn't want the father. He wanted the father's stuff. And the father is trying to remind him in the moment, I'm the gift. I'm always with you. I'm the gift, not my stuff. And if I can be honest, I've been a part of uh, the church body my, my whole life. My dad was a pastor. And I, so I've seen just generations of Christians in, in our church culture, at least here in America. And, and I say this loving as lovingly as I can. I feel like sometimes we miss it and we forget that the father is the gift and we just want his stuff. The father is the gift. God's love is not built on the foundation of our qualities. Rather, it is built on the foundation of God's character. And so in about the 10 minutes we have left in our time together, I, I want to leave you with some handles as I'm speaking to the older brother. And if, if, if you're new here or, or new to Jesus, I'm not, I'm not necessarily speaking to you, but I'm speaking to people that call themselves followers of Jesus. And, and I, I'm drawing upon the authority of the word here to say something that I think we desperately need to hear. I need to hear this. It's not my goodness and it's not my character that earns me any place in God's family. It's his goodness and his character alone that I get to enjoy a relationship with him. And so my challenge to you today as we work through, I have a few points that I wanna leave you with. Don't gatekeep the father's love. Don't gatekeep the Father's love. Don't put qualifiers on people that are far from Jesus and prevent them from even coming into this community to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. I was thinking about this concept with the broken knee story. How much sense would it have made if I went to go meet uh, awesome Dr. Slaughter, sitting down with Dr. Slaughter, and he's going over the, the surgery with me and my parents, and he's like, all right, well, we can definitely take care of the ACL. Might may, maybe be able to take care of the meniscus, but here's what I need you to do. Um, I'm going to send you home. You're going to go home. Uh, you're going to work on your kneecap. We really need you. It's gross and icky, and like there's pieces everywhere. You got to figure that all out. You got to like maybe glue your knee back together on your own. Once you get that little problem figured out, then maybe we'll consider doing the ACL meniscus. How much sense does that make? It makes no sense. I have no tools, no skills, no ability on my own to figure out how to get this thing put back together. 
And the same is true in ourselves. You do not possess the tools, the knowledge, the ability to fix yourself on your own. So why would we apply that on the people around us? This is what we call a a works or performance-based perspective of the gospel instead of a faith-based approach to the gospel. It's unbiblical. It's dishonorable, in my opinion, and it gatekeeps the Father's love. A works-based perspective of the gospel, firstly, undermines Jesus. It undermines Jesus. We, we, we feel self-righteous and, and we say, uh, I am saved by my own hand. I, I got here because I earned it. The Father loves me because I earned it. The younger brother being the prodigal, you know, when he came to himself in that moment and saw his past mistakes said, my failures erode my worth. I'm not, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy to even come into his presence. I'm not worthy to be his son. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, I loved you first. You did not choose me, but I chose you. The, the second thing a works uh, based perspective on the gospel does is it wrongfully plots the future. It wrongfully plots the future. Uh, in my self righteousness, I say, my future is secure because I hold it. I, I've got it all together and I determine my own destiny. Shame says, you'll never over, overcome your failures. So just give up. Don't even try. You can't do it. Jesus says, I am the author and perfecter of your faith. I initiate it and I fulfill it. I'm faithful to fulfill it. The third thing, a works-based perspective on the gospel gives us, is it leads us away from Jesus and ultimately towards ourselves. It leads us away from Jesus. In my self-righteousness, I say, I am the hero of my story. I'm blessed and highly favored because of things I've done. Shame rejects your admission into the family of God and it turns your failure inward. You look inward towards yourself to to being the solution for uh, overcoming my guilt and my shame. And I feel like I have to be punished for all the bad things I've done before I can even ever come into the presence of God. But Jesus on the cross fulfilled that. And he says, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I love the book of Romans. Romans is like uh, just a, the Sparks Notes, Spark Notes version of uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And kind of as you're reading these parables, you're like, oh my gosh, what does that mean? Well, Paul provides clarity for us in Romans. And I love what Romans chapter three has to say about all of this, this concept called unmerited grace. You can't earn God's love. You're qualified by Jesus. You've probably heard this phrase, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. If you've heard that, right? That's Romans uh, chapter three, verse 23. And that's found in most translations. Uh, But what I'd love to read for you is actually the message paraphrase. And it's not a translation, but it takes some translations and scriptures from the Bible and it puts it in a modern vernacular that sometimes just hits us differently and can make it kind of sink in more. So here's what Romans chapter three, verse 23 and 24 say from the message paraphrase. The God setting things right thing that we've read about has become the Jesus setting things right for us. And not only for us, but everyone who believes in him. For there is no difference between us and them in this. Since we've compiled this long and sorry record as sinners, both, both us and them, and proved that we are utterly incapable of living the glorious lives God wills for us. God did it for us. Out of sheer generosity, he put us in right standing with himself, a pure gift. He got us out of the mess we're in and restored us to where we, he always wanted us to be. And he did it by means of Jesus Christ. Do you hear that? I love what the ESV says at the end. What becomes of our boasting? It's excluded because of the work of Jesus Christ alone. Not because of anything that we've done, but because of Jesus Christ. I boast in his work and his victory through the cross. 
not in my own goodness. And if I can be so bold, older brothers, if I could be so bold, I love you so much to be able to say this to you. If I could be so bold to help us get over ourselves, I want to highlight a quote from a guy I like to read from, an old dead Christian, Jonathan Edwards, perfectly summarizes what we need to hear today. You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. You contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary. Your qualities don't qualify you for your love. You are qualified by Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Christ and I need him alone. Much grace, much grace has been given to you, older brother. Let's extend that same grace to those around us, to those that are far from him. A final point, just as you have not been disqualified, do not disqualify others. So I've been in leadership now from the military and and church life since 2009. And and something I've come to value as a leader is uh, something I believe in is I'm not going to ask you to do something I'm not willing to do myself. And, and so I'd like to share uh, one thing that the Lord had me work through about three years ago. Uh, th- three years ago, last month actually, was the anniversary of the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. And as someone that's uh, spent two years of his life in Afghanistan and the most of my adult life oriented on that country and helping those people um, f- find their footing again and help that nation thrive. Uh, the Lord had me in those two weeks, we were withdrawing uh, very rapidly uh, and the, it just, the whole nation seemed to collapse under Taliban um, um, military power. The Lord had me work through day by day a prayer for specific people. And so uh, my first prayer that I feel like he asked me to pray was for the Afghan children. And yes, Lord, we're going to pray for their safety and getting them into a better situation. The next day was like uh, our, our interpreters, our friends that helped us, uh, uh, Afghan women. Yes, Lord, protect them all. Find them safety. Um, and then the next day comes around and I just I could not relent, couldn't let it go. But in my spirit, I felt like God was saying, and pray for the Taliban. Pray for their salvation. Pray that they would come to know Jesus. And all I could feel in my heart was like, those people, those people don't deserve you. Do you know what they've done? Do you know what they've done to my friends? You, you, you didn't die for them. You died for us, people like us, right? That's not what this book says. This book says the same Jesus that died for someone as broken as me died for someone as evil as them. And that no one is far, no one is too far from a second chance. That was a hard prayer to pray. And I think for me, it just highlighted how wonderful our Lord is, how unending and supernatural his love is. Uh, My love is so fickle and finite. Last week, Pastor Drew, uh, as we wrap up the series, invited us to uh, write names of R1 on a light bulb. And so if you were here for that, uh, thank you so much for participating in that. But if you weren't, we'd like to show you kind of a recap of how that moment kind of landed. So let's watch this video. We have a deep care for those who do not know Jesus. And if God cares about the one, we probably should too. We risk our all to reach the one. And we do this because it's clear that Jesus values the one. Like he's willing to leave the 99 in the open country to go find the one. He's willing to light the lamp and turn the house upside down to find the one. What are we willing to do for the one? I'm, I'm, venturing to guess that Jesus is inviting us to risk our all to reach the one. Who is your one? Who is your one? I do know that your one who doesn't have that relationship with Jesus, they may be in your neighborhood. They may be at your workplace. They might even be in your home. Friends, there's something powerful that happens when we can identify them. And we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're just gonna bring them to the Lord in prayer. This is what God is capable of doing 
when we carry that same value for the one just as he does. And I don't know what your part is gonna play in it, but today is just an invitation just to start praying. Lord, use any means necessary to connect this one to you. Give them your hope, your life, and your salvation. So I personally want to thank each and every single one of you that participated in that last week. And as you can see, we roughly have about 650 light bulbs, but as you can also see, we have plenty more gaps available. And so uh, at the end of the service today, there are baskets of uh, empty light bulbs with, uh, there's no names on them, with Sharpies right next. If you have a name on your heart and you haven't engaged in this, please don't leave today without writing a name of your one. And then you could put it in a bucket uh, in the back of the room on your way out. This is simply a first step of faith we're taking as, as a people. I know it takes courage to share your story, but your story wasn't just meant for you. God is working through you to show his love for the world. Who do you know that is far away? Who do you know that's had this reality moment that, man, I am in a really, really bad place and I don't know what else to do? Would you help show them that their only hope is the Father? Scan the horizon and with the Father, run towards them, not away from them, and embrace them and celebrate them when they enter into his family. As we close today, we've been doing... uh, this, this kind of prayer, corporate prayer moment. I'd love to close our time today with this corporate prayer. I'm gonna read it first and then we're all gonna read it together twice. Lord, open our eyes to the reality of your love for us. Give us a new heart. Help us to run towards those far from you. And let's read it together. Lord, open our eyes to the reality of your love for us. Give us a new heart. Help us to run towards those far from you. Lord, open our eyes to the reality of your love for us. Give us a new heart. Help us to run toward those far from you. God, that's our prayer today, Lord. As we seek out the lost, as we seek out those that are so far from you. God, help us to see ourselves the way you see us not qualified by our badness or goodness or uh, our failures today or tomorrow or yesterday, God. Help us to see ourselves through Jesus Christ, his power, his blood, his righteousness. God, in the areas of our life where we maybe excluded or discarded people and said, that's, you're not for them. (laughs) Lord, would you just help us God, free us from that bondage, that box that we've put people in and help us to not gatekeep, but be door holders for your love. I thank you for this gathered body. I thank you how you're you're speaking through them now and thank you for the ways that they've engaged. Give them courage and strength to share your story with the world. It's in your name I pray, amen.